Uh, what I'm going to tell you about today, it, it's not really topological, but it's a, it's a technique that I've been developing at UC Riverside to create Joseph's injunctions. And what I hope is that it inspires you in some structures that you can possibly make. So to get started, I'm gonna give you a brief background and I'm gonna just rip through this because I, I think this is just a, a little too um, under your, your guys' knowledge level. Um, but Joseph's injunctions you know, got its beginning in the 60s and it was just this landmark paper where Josephson said that if you separate two insulate or two superconducting electrodes by a thin insulating barrier, that you could get tunneling of the superconducting pairs through that insulator. But the key is, is that insulator has to be really small, very narrow, so that the probability that the, the carrier can actually pop up on the other side is finite. And I'm not gonna, you know, this, these are the first Josephson equation and the second Josephson equation. I'm, I'm assume you guys all know that inside out. Um, in electrical engineering and physics, we like to model a Josephson junction as the ideal Josephson component or the Josephson current and a resistor connected in shine. And we can rewrite the currents across those in terms of the quantum mechanical phase by using the first Josephson equation and the second Josephson equation. And we get a simple differential equation that we can solve. And we, we get the familiar IV characteristic of current versus voltage. And with IC being the maximum supercurrent that can flow through the device and the resistance out at high voltages RN, the product of those two is a figure of merit for Josephson junctions. Now I work on Josephson junctions and high TC materials and, and that's mainly what my talk's gonna be about or all of what my talks is gonna be about. And high TC materials, as you many may know, were developed in the, or discovered in the late 1980s. And these are much different than conventional superconductors in that they're ceramics and they don't have as many charge carriers and they have these complex crystal structures. Um, YBCO crystallizes in an orthorhombic structure and it's different in every direction. And so that gives you the resistivity and electrical properties that are different in every direction, as well as a coherence length. And this creates a problem in high TC devices in that you don't really want your transport current to be going perpendicular to the substrate along that C axis, because if that happens, you, you, um, you, you really have a hard time getting currents through it and you have a lot of bad interfaces and things. So as a device engineer, you really wanna get all your currents in the plane, in the AB plane where the, in, in particular along that B, at B chain where the resistivity is the lowest. And I think that's where I have a lot of overlap with you guys is that um, I have a lot of interest in planar junctions. And I think a lot of the geometries that you, I've seen in some of these talks here um, really uh, need a, a, a planar solution to the Josephson effect. And I, I think we already have a lot of um, experience in that, and I'm gonna show you about it. And the way that we make our Josephson junctions, we, we it kind of exploit something that's usually detrimental. And early on when ITC just kind of, you know, hit the, hit the scene, both Bell Laboratories and IBM was working on experience, uh, experiments where they ion damaged the YBCO or, or a high TC film and put some disorder in it. And when they put that disorder in, what they saw is when you looked at the resistivity as a function of temperature for a YBCO film that was irradiated subsequently with different doses, here they used one MeV neon ions, but it worked similarly with other ions and other people done these experiments in Europe and Cambridge and there was others everywhere. And what they found differently from conventional superconductors is that if you increase the dose to a very high level, the material will actually transition into an insulating state here, like at the top trace. You can see as you cool down, the, the resistance is going off. And none of the metallic superconductors did that. The me metallic superconductors, they still showed the effect where you increased resistivity a little bit and you reduced TC with this order, but that value um, it always stopped at around three Kelvin or so, and it always stayed metallic. It never really went through this metal insulator quantum phase transition. And this is why YBCO films degrade very easily. And um, they, you know, it, it's hard to 
have a good shelf life with, with some devices, it's because that the material is extremely sensitive. But we can use that to make Joseph's injunctions. If we can, can, can control the area that we make the damage and we can control it to the nanoscale, like that first Joseph's injunction that I showed, it's a, it's a way to make Joseph's devices. And that's exactly what we've been doing. And this started in, you know, way before my time in the field, uh, you know, I think uh, Mark Blomire was one of the pioneers as well, Bob Dines, my PhD advisor, and they would make these junctions, but these junctions that they made were much bigger. They, they were using masking and um, ion damage through that. And, and here's, an, here's a slide that really shows how they did it. So here is a YBCO film, and then here's a high aspect ratio mass that they built over top of it. And then they just used RIE etching and E-beam lithography to make this channel in here. And when you radiate this down, ions get stopped in the mask here, but they get through and they can reduce the TC here. And in those old days, when they tried to make that weak link insulating, transport didn't get through. Nothing got through because the smallest dimensions you could really practically make using this fabrication process are greater than 10 nanometers. And once you get greater than 10 nanometers, it's, you can't get tunneling through the, the barrier of, or an insulating barrier. So in practice, what folks would do is they just would damage this down so that the TC would just reduce by say maybe 10 Kelvin. So if you have a 90K superconductor, you beat this TC down to around 80 Kelvin or so and you run the device at 77 and you get a proximity effect junction. And here's some data from some of those early proximity effect junctions. And they had really you know, well distributed current because they show that Fraunhofer pattern, but the resistance is quite low. And when you have these really low resistances on um, these Joseph's injunctions, it picks up every bit of environmental noise and they're actually really hard to work with. And also your ICRN product is really small and you have excess current, which I think many of you probably are familiar with because I've heard you talking about Blonder, Kinkum and Clapwick. And it's just, it's a natural thing that comes out of an SNS type junction. So in, in short, from what we learned in the past, we realized that for better junctions, we need more defects concentrated into a smaller volume. So we want to make the material resistive into the insulating state, but we want to get that narrowed down so that we can actually see tunneling through the device. And there wasn't really a good way to do this for a long time um, besides nanolithography and etching, but in the late, maybe early 2000s, a new machine came on the, on the scene and that's called the focused helium ion beam. And this is the Orion Nanofab from Carl Zeiss. It's the more modern machine, but in the old day, when they first built it, it was a, a bit bigger instrument. And I'm gonna tell you a little bit about how it works and how it's different from a gallium fib. So this is the field ion microscope. This is the forefather of that Zeiss Nanofab. And the field ion microscope, is, is pretty straightforward. You have a UHV ve vacuum vessel that about MBE pressure, so really good vacuum in there. You have a tungsten wire that you sharpen down, really sharp, and then you cool that wire down, apply a high voltage of about 30 kilovolts between the wire and the extractor, then you leak whatever your, your gas is that you want to try to field ionize, typically helium or neon, and this wire starts to cry a pump. That's why you cool it down. You get some gas that starts to kind of come close to that tip. And when it gets close to the tip, it field ionizes off the atoms in the tip. And you can accelerate it through the hole in the extractor and you can light up a skinnilator screen. And this was the, the original field ion microscope developed in the 50s by Muller. And you know this is probably the first time that people seen something that represented atoms. And it wasn't really practical though for milling and doing the things that we do with gallium because you don't get a lot of current off it. Here's the apex of a you know, hypothetical tip and you have all these different atoms and these are where the field ionizations occur and it really spreads out over that whole tip because the tip's quite blunt on, a, on the scale of the electric field. And when you look at that screen, you can see all the different atoms that are radiating on the screen. What Zeiss figured out, or Alice and Zeiss together figured out how to do, is how to make this tip so sharp that you only have about three atoms at the tip. So we have these three atoms at the tip here. You can see the, the image in the center here that, that actually shows a, a real tip from a 
machine in my lab. And this is the outer ring of the tip. And then none of the other atoms really ionize any gas. So it's really most of your gas is concentrated right there. We aperture that down and it's installed inside of a column and we can accelerate it right down just like it's a SEM at that point. And the, the key here is now we have a, a, a probe size that's almost a hundred times smaller than a gallium fib when you start milling features and sizes. The sputter yields much less, so it takes you much longer, but you can really do fine features. And the newer Zeiss machine that we just installed also has neon gas, so that has a little bit more milling power. So you can do where you, you go in with the gallium first, then you can clean it up with neon, and you can do really fine structures with helium. But to make Joseph's injunctions, we didn't want to go buy one of these machines. We wanted before when we wanted to first test this out. So I took a postdoc and a lock in amplifier to Boston and went and visited the demo lab. And this was um, some work that we did, the original work in 2015, where we took about a dozen samples over to Zeiss. This was a YBCO film of five by five millimeter substrate. It's got a gold electrode that was put down in situ. And we ion milled away just in the center and thinned the film down a little bit. And we, we loaded that into the Zeiss Orion and we just scanned the beam over regions four point pro bridges. And we, we, we did different doses. And what we found from that experiment was that at doses about two times 10 to the 16, we got a, a set of proximity effect type junctions. These look just like an SS, SNS that we saw previously. However, the resistances were about an order of magnitude higher and the temperature range that we could operate them on was quite large. So we, we think we were starting to concentrate some of the defects in there. If we fit those IV characteristics, you can see the, the critical current keeps growing as you cool down. That's because the excess current takes over. It's not a Josephson current. It actually, it's just the excess current that takes over. Here you have the resistance as a function of temperature. It's going down just as you expect for a normal metal. Now, if we bump the dose up just a little bit, six times 10 to the 16, we get a different set of curves. They have a, a crossing point down here at lower voltage, opposed to the other curves. When we fit the data for those curves, we see that the critical current has a different dependence and it, it looks like it's flattening out. And the normal state resistance now is going up. So we've actually went through the superconductor insulator transition when we irradiated these. And this was uh, probably one of the first times somebody made uh, a controlled SIS junction that wasn't a brake junction in uh, planar YBCO. And if we take that same SIS junction from the other page at four Kelvin, and we bias it out. So here's the junction that I showed on the other page at a hundred microvolt scale. If we bias it out about a thousand times, now millivolt scale, then you really start to see the nonlinearity in there. The critical current's so small, you can't see it in this picture here. Um, and there's some structure in here that we can pull out with the lock-in amplifier and we can get the energy gap edge of what looks to be a D-wave superconductor. Um, what, what's unique here to the ones that people get from scanning tunneling or other types of measurements is we got the actual Josephson current there in the middle. So we can actually see the Josephson current inside the middle of the gap, which is uh, another first. And if we fit that gap edge here as a function of temperature, it fits nicely with BCS with a slight shift of the TC, which is probably due to heating because of the size of the device. But it's interesting that we, we, we get that relationship. So after those experiments, we thought, hey, this is a great way to make Joseph's injunctions. So we bought that machine over in uh, Boston and I brought it back to my lab here at UC Riverside and we learned how to make better junctions. So now you can really see, you know, this is probably one of the best set or best junction that we made. It goes from four and a half Kelvin to 53 Kelvin and, and look, goes into something that looks just like a very classic type Joseph's injunction. So we're really, with this technique, you know, the, the real key is, is when we get that resistance up high enough, you choke out those Andrea reflections and you're, you're really, you know, it's, it's really blonder Tinkum Clapwick, right? I mean, you're really, you're, you're raising Z, you're raising the strength of the barrier. So you choke out all the excess current and all the junk and you have a real device. So here shows a chip where we have about 20 bridges inside the center and some other electrodes that we can use for bias. And we, we made a, a set of Joseph injunctions and we, we wanted to clearly show the metal insulator transition. So this is the extracted RN from the IV plotted in a log temperature plot. And over here you can see I see a T 
where it actually goes into this transition where it kind of rolls over. So this gives us confidence that we can change the, the parameters pretty easily. So now I'm gonna shift gears and talk about something called a nanowire junction, which is another kind of thing that we uh, discovered along with this uh, focused helium ion work. And what a nanowire junction is, as I mentioned earlier, you know, this material is so sensitive to disorder, it always degrades. So if you, if you try to make anything smaller than a few microns, the material, you know, it doesn't last very long or, you know, it, it dies or the ion mill that you use to cut the structure uh, burns it all up. So what we found is that, you know, maybe we can try to use the ion beam in the same way that we pattern the junction at higher doses to create insulating YBCO to put a restriction in a bridge. So here's an example, here's a four micron bridge where we irradiate two side banks without etching away the material so you don't get the outward diffusion and the heating. And we wanna restrict the current to go down a, a narrow filament. And we place the Josephson junction right in the center so that when we're looking at transport characteristics, it's a four point measurement on the Josephson junction because the leads are superconducting. And we made a whole set of, of these uh, different devices. And remarkably, um, the material was, was quite uniform and all the junctions had ICRNs of about 400 microvolt. And the only thing that changes is the mention that we um, thinned it down or, or narrowed it, necked it down. Here's the four micron control device. And then here's devices for two microns, one micron, all the way down to 50 nanometers. There was a 25 nanometer he didn't put in the paper because the critical current was smeared out. but. Um, it, it was just a thermally activated junction at that point. Um, but the unique part is, you know, we're really, if you look over here on the right, the critical current is uh, pretty much linear with the dimension that we defined using the helium ion beam. So it really gives us confidence that we, you know, we are really patterning it so like we think we are. Now the normal resistance is, is shooting up as you'd expect, but the right variable is, of course is the normal conductance because that's gonna change as you, as you change the size, any, any kind of dimension. I and mean, that's also linear. So this really gives us confidence that the beam can really reach down to these small dimensions to pattern devices. And this shows the magnetic field dependence for up until the one micron device because the uh, magnetic field strength of our coil inside of our Josephson junction probe doesn't go that high. Um, and we, we would need to go into a superconducting magnet, which is much noisier. And uh, at that point, we probably wouldn't see the critical currents on the small junctions. So we did another experiment because we're really interested in the anisotropy of YBCO, or, and we wanted to really look at the, the gap to see if we could pick up the D wave uh, structure. And the motivation for this is to shrink it down to a single grain, because we, we, we imagine if we're, we have a lot of twin boundaries that that could disrupt what we're trying to measure. So we try to shrink this down to something that's a detwinned area of the device. So by doing that, we, we cut a, a, a dot of YBCO, this, this one right here, I think is about 12 microns or so, or 13 microns, hard for me to even read that. Um, but then we remove the gold contact over the YBCO area. And then we go into here and we pattern that structure that I just showed. And we do gap measurements at different angles to, to see what we get, same way that I showed in the other data. And this is an interesting result that we found in, a, in one of our best YBCO films. And we really get something that looks more like a S wave gap with a you know a little bit of anisotropy from the orth orthorhombic lattice, and um, you know it's basically ranging from 30 millivolts to 65 millivolts, but there's absolutely no nodes in it. So um, we we do know that there was a lot of work of people tunneling from lead into YBCO, and YBCO is one that is supposed to have a pretty large S component along with the D wave component. So we wanted to start looking at uh, bismuth 2212, which is supposed to be more anisotropic. So now I'm gonna tell you about the work that we just recently did in bismuth 2212. Um, here's an exfoliated flake. I, I believe it's about 30 nanometers thick that my student uh, placed four probes on to do um, the same type of experiment. And what we did is we used a high dose here on the edge like we did for those nanowire junctions to kind of neck it down and get enough resistance uh, into the junction. And then we did a lighter dose to serve in the center as the Josephson junction barrier. And here shows an IB characteristic of a, a typical junction result. Uh, they have a small critical current, I believe because of the thin film and probably some of the layers are probably dead on the bottom and the top. 
but it, and it has a good resistance of about 8.8 .8 ohms. It um, allows us to kind of get out to higher biases. But we wanted to first check and make sure we weren't seeing intrinsic junctions. So we apply a magnetic field perpendicular to the substrate and measure that Fraunhofer pattern. And we get this beautiful Fraunhofer pattern uh, that, that tells us this is a planar junction, matter of fact. So we measure the temperature dependence of the, the same junction and we can see it has that crossing point feature like I showed in the other SIS type junctions. Um, so these are would be of the insulating type. The ICRN product is a bit low, I, I think, for uh, this, this type of device. I think it's the material is slightly underdoped. Um, we started with the optimally doped crystal, but I, I think what happens is you lose some of the oxygen from, from it through the processing. But we were able to get the resistance up high enough to get a good measurement of the gap or, or a measurement of the gap. Uh, it's got the Josephson peak in the center um, and we can pull out the temperature dependence. It looks quite a bit different from what we saw in the YBCO. It's not really flattening out. It looks like it's just kind of diverging. Um, and we, we definitely want to get some more studies of these. This was really the, the first gap measurement that we got out of these. So the real next step here is can we, we build one, you know, like a dot? Can we get a few different directions? And can we try to piece together the anisotropy of the, the bismuth 2212? So the last thing I want to tell you about is um, some work on nanosquids that my group is doing. I, I, I think it's uh, just really amazing the um, kind of the structures that you can make. A squid, just for those of you that may not know what a squid is, it's two Josephson junctions connected in a superconducting loop. It was first developed or invented by Ford Motor Company, which is uh, where I grew up as a kid. So kind of proud to talk about that. That's when the car companies used to do science back then. And when you have a magnetic field or a flux that penetrates the loop that those junctions are on, you get quantum interference between the supercurrents that are inside the Josephson junctions, and you can get this um, kind of sinusoidal uh, voltage that's across the squid. And you can use this as a very sensitive detector of magnetic flux. But we wanted to develop uh, a different type of squid that we um, that's a nano squid, but we wanted to make it a sensitive nano squid. Typically, when you shrink the area of the squid down, the noise properties of the Josephson junctions get smaller. But as you shrink the area down, you get less flux into it, so you're 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 not really gaining anything. So in this structure, what we did is we created a, a nano slit squid where we have here's the slit. That's where the flux is going to penetrate. It's made with a high dose of helium irradiation. Um, no material is etched or removed, so we're just converting it to an insulator so that the fluxons can penetrate through the insulating material. Um, over here, we make two trimmed Josephson junctions. So these are insulators that we plug in here to allow us to bring this resistance up to uh, where we can match this squid to uh, room temperature electronics. Uh, what you don't see is this other loop. So here's the actual device. Here's where the squid lives in the center. And this other loop that comes around is another inductor. It's just a superconducting loop that focuses flux inside of the, the squid because it shares an arm with the actual squid hole. And here are the results from that particular squid. Uh, this shows the really high uh, normal state resistance of about 12 ohms that we, we got that thing up to. Uh, the squid voltage at about 400 microvolts is about an order of magnitude higher than most high TC squids. The flux noise is quite great. Uh, two microfine op per root herd is also about an order of magnitude lower. Um, and the four pico tesla, typically you hear numbers of like femto tesla. The four pico tesla is um, actually a pretty good number for a micro squid because this is a micromagnetometer and it's not um, like a one centimeter magnetometer, which is typically going to have femto tesla. So it really depends on the area of the chip. But we wanted to go smaller because there's some other things that. Um, we're, we're motivated for for these nano squids. So I asked one of my postdocs to, to work on scaling it down. And he developed a chip that has four nano squids in the center. Each one of these devices is a nano squid. And the key innovation that he really came up with was that it's hard to get flux into a nano squid, right? Because as you get this thing smaller and smaller, um, it's more hard to you know get that good mutual coupling. So what, what he came up with is he said, let's get a a superconducting input line nanometers away from the squid. So here he uses a, a helium ion line to irradiate and draw an insulating line in the material. It's only about 10 nanometers wide. 
So when you pass a current through here, the current's only 10 nanometers from the squid and you couple a whole lot of flux in there. And that, that was really the, the innovation here. And this zooms in on that. So this shows the center of the chip again. And, and here you can see the insulating lines that were placed in to structure the device. The square represents the, the pickup area of the squid and the red represents the nanojoseph injunctions that are placed in. This trim is put in to set the resistance to this junction. And here's the coupled flux that we use to activate the nano squid. Uh, figure C is interesting because that's a helium ion image that was taken right after we wrote a device inside of YBCL. And in a helium ion image, the insulating regions um, actually look dark and you pick up the contrast. So this is the actual YBCL film that you're looking down at and picking up the contrast. Here you have an AFM that shows the structure. And um, what, we, what you see with the AFM is the material is actually bulging where we irradiate it. So what happens is the helium goes down into the substrate and then kind of mechanically raises it up a little bit. So there is some structural damage that's done for the very high dose areas. But here are the IV characteristics for, the, for a device that has a 400 nanometer squid loop. It has a nearly temperature independent resistance from 54 Kelvin all the way down to 4.2 Kelvin. That's very, very uncommon for high TC squids. It's, um, it's uh, yeah, it's, there's none, uh, none other squids that do that. In fact, the resistance of 32 ohms is, is also very high for a high TC squid and it was intentional. Actually, we're, we're shooting for 50 ohms um, to, to actually match this to a, a room temperature amplifier. And here are the, the voltage magnetic field characteristics of that squid. And it shows that we're really getting to fractions of a millivolt now when we get down to 4.2 Kelvin. And this really comes from that resistance. As you get that resistance up really high, you can really get the good voltage modulation because when you drop the critical current of the squid, you actually, you, you drop the inductive uh, parameter which gives you a deeper modulation and, and more voltage and lower noise. So that it's, a, it's really, you know, it's a, it's a great um, way to do it. But what we built this one for was for a trans impedance amplifier where we really wanted to take signals that were down inside of a, a cryostat or a low temperature experiment from niobium type um, junction junctions that you activate with milliamp type pulses. And we wanted to be able to connect that to a room temperature amplifier that is you know, really looking for a voltage device. So we, we just, what this actually does is it takes those milliamps of current and converts it to millivolts at a very high impedance. So the th three milliamps at the superconducting input, right, the impedance of that is zero, where when we, we put it through the squid amplifier, now we have this 32 ohm output impedance. So I, the, the postdoc was like, hey, this is a great amplifier. And I was like, well, you know, 400 nanometers, it's just kind of big. You need to really push this thing down if you want to get it on a cover of something or get a good paper. So he went into the lab and he built this one that was 50 by 50 nanometers. And it had a really great ICRN product of 1.3 millivolts, um, 24 ohms, high resistance, and a, and a really good uh, voltage modulation. There's some uh, ripples in here. And this is because look at the field scale here. This is, you know, 10 millitesla. So you remember my other experiment, I was like, hey, my magnetic field coil and my quiet probe doesn't go up that high. This was done in a PPMS. So when you, as soon as you put, uh, you know, a good junction into a PPMS, you, you get curves like that. But it wasn't enough. And I, I was like, hey, if you really want to get the job, you got to be smaller than the squid on a tip because everybody's, you know, that's I think it's about 50 nanometers or so. So he went in and he just burned one hole with the focused ion beam, which we estimate is about 10 by 10 nanometers. And we, we get very similar characteristics, the critical current, so the junctions came out smaller, uh, but we also got the really high voltage modulation curves as well. Um, the field periodicity didn't change much. In fact, it went the opposite way. Um, but we think what happens is once you get the squid down to such a small distance, it's just limited by the penetration depth of the material. So whatever the, you're really, the, the area of the squid is just too lambda. You can ignore the size of the hole at that point. So with that, I'd like to thank all the people that really made all this happen. Two of my postdocs just left. Um, one went to LAM Research. The other, the guy that made that squid got the job and now he's a assistant professor at University of Kansas. So I guess me pushing him kind of paid off. Here are some of the recent papers that we did and the folks that pay the bills 
And because all these people are leaving, uh, I got immediate openings for two postdocs over here in, in Riverside. And um, it's to run a new machine that I got that has the gallium helium neon nano probers and a gas injection printer and all kinds of cool stuff in it. And I'm also actively recruiting graduate students because I just had two people graduate and one of them went to NIST, the other one went to a company called Quantum Design. Um, all your tuition's paid, and I'll also give you a salary that is enough to live on in Southern California. And if you just want to come check out and hang out with us for a summer, I also have undergraduate research fellowships um, for, for summer support for travel and, and food and stuff while you're here working. Um, and with that, um, be happy to answer any questions.